This week on Painting Lines. Her catch versus Dimitrov. Her catch, an extra two and a half hours on court. That just kind of balances out the fact that he is, whatever, five years younger than Dimitrov. I know. I think he's got to do something as far as sports psychologists or someone on his team to help him with that because it's clearly his Achilles heel. He would make a shot and the coach would stand up and like yeah. whip his towel around. <laughs> and you're like, this dude is into it. Welcome to the Painting Lines Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things tennis. Join Eric and Aiden in their discussion for updates on news and pop culture. And from hot takes to betting, they've got you covered. Ready? Play. Welcome back to Painting Lines. Last week, we uh, broke down the clay surface, talking about what makes it unique and how it impacts the game at the highest level. And this week, with the French Open essentially at its midpoint, we wanted to break down what we've seen through the first few rounds and our big takeaways. So, Eric, just starting us off, how about you hit us with one kind of broad comment on the first week? Was it good? Was it bad? Did you see what kind of what you expected or was it more unexpected? Yeah, definitely. So let's see. Um, something positive here is that we are seeing Sinner and Alcaraz healthy. Because remember, going into this tournament, there's a big question mark on them. And to be honest, I was kind of thinking, oh, we'll see kind of a 50, 60 percent center, maybe an 80 percent Alcaraz. But they're cruising through. They're looking in top shape. So that's a good one to see. Um, another thing I wanted to kind of touch on, not so positive, Tommy Paul being upset by Sorundolo. And it's weird because I say upset, but I mean, Sorundolo has the better head-to-head -head record he's four and two against him he beat him previously in madrid and i feel like this was a pretty tough draw for tommy just going in because it was surrendola was a name like oh if you were to come across he just lost to him in madrid um unfortunately you know that's who i had going pretty deep tommy paul in roland garros and this just leaves one american left in the draw so in fritz we trust yeah uh the interesting thing about that matchup is like you would think, oh, okay, it's it's four and two. Oh, are they does he always beat him on only clay? But I mm -hmm. think only their past two matchups have been on clay. So generally it's they have a pretty even record on all surfaces, and Sorendolo is the better player on clay. So interesting to look at that, given that Tommy Paul is, like you said, the higher ranked player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just kind of a bummer i don't know what did you think about the americans and roland garros do you think this was a pretty good showing for them you know we still have fritz in the round four i mean it, it's you look at it and it's like okay what did we expect essentially this right seeing all of the americans out by round three it's like yeah you didn't really expect that much more out of them but i feel like you were hoping for more oh definitely hoping and i you know, maybe this is a little like positive ignorance, but just after Ben Sheldon won Houston, I was thinking, oh shit, we have a great clay player. We have, you know, potential to win a Masters or go, you know, win a Grand Slam title. But that was kind of a tease. Yeah, I think that's a little overly <laughs> positive. I, I feel like I, I didn't feel that that Tiafo was a big threat on clay after he won Houston last year. So yeah, that's a good point. And plus a final this year too. That's pretty much the last we've seen of him huh yeah i mean I we'll talk about that in a little bit but not great really yeah showing for him here i know so let's uh let's jump into the draw sounds good sounds good so first up round of 128 uh first match i want to talk about is my guy murray honestly he just looks so bad at this point <laughs> i watched this full match with vavrinka and it just looks like every single point he's in constant pain. He's bent over. He looks exhausted. It's just so tough to watch. And I'm like, man, like it's painful given what we know you used to be able to do. And it's just a struggle to be, to be watching a guy that was such a legend, not be able to play like even close to a high level. Like he can't, it doesn't feel like he can beat anybody right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to kind of go into his head because you think it's painful watching him. Imagine if you're playing it. Like, yeah. I, that's exactly kind of how a team must have felt when he was playing in those challengers and losing. Like, he was literally at the top of the world, you know, maybe 
not as good as Murray was in his peak, but still top tennis player now losing routine matches in pretty unsavory fashion. Exactly. Yeah. And he's like, I don't want to just be sitting here <laughs> just losing these matches where I feel like I'm better than these guys. Mm -hmm. So you think summer, you think this is it for him, for Andy? I think so. I think oh, so. Oh shit, man. Yeah. I would love to yeah. see him getting the coaching, you know, see him in a box. Yeah. That'd be cool to see. I feel like, yeah, I, I don't know <laughs> what, who I'd want to see him coach though. I know. I don't know who he would jive well with. Yeah. Cause I feel like he's a very, you know, interesting personality pretty hot tempered huh i think it would have to be a like a, a british player that just respected his opinion so much that even when he gets angry <laughs> at them he's like this guy's a legend <laughs> yeah i know because you gotta it's like uh oh what does this old guy know you know yeah exactly like that type of thing and then you go wait a second this guy was world number <laughs> one one three grand slams so <laughs> yeah what about stan though i, I know we've talked a lot about andy but is this also you think Stan's last summer or he's just kind of no, I think he's, he's kind of just it. cruising. I think the thing about Stan is like he's old for yeah. a tennis player, like he's 39, but Jeez. he's not as much of like an injury prone sort of player. So he's feeling like probably better at 39 than Murray is at 37. I feel like he's also not really pushing himself too hard. Like he's happy to play in these tournaments and you know win, lose, draw, whatever, he's collecting a check. And I think Murray may have been overtraining or obviously went through a lot more injuries back in the day. But, yeah, I, th I don't think Stan's, you know, routine is he's not going to overpractice. He's going to pretty much just play these tournaments, stay yep. as fresh as he can at 39. I mean, I, I'll be honest. He looked – Vavrinka looked good in this match for 39. Mm -hmm. And Murray looked so just beaten down. But. Yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on, another big comment from the first round. Both Chileans out in the first round, uh, Jari and Tabilo. I mentioned this on the last episode, but I had to bring it back up again because it's just a bummer. Like, these guys mm -hmm. played so well in Italy, only to go out on the biggest stage and just lose super early. Just feels bad. Like, when you see a guy perform well, you kind of want to be like, oh, okay, is this going to be the pattern in the future? And clearly for them – not so much. And I think this was kind of a big disappointment in his career where he is, because like you said, he's playing so well. He had just made it to a semifinal and this would have been kind of an exclamation point on his career. Like he's able to back up his play the rest of the year, but the early exit just kind of sets him back. And it does pose the question that we're talking about. Like, okay. Is this guy a fluke? Cause if he made it at least, you know, second, third round, we're saying, Oh, he's consistent. He's playing great tennis. He's been doing it for the last six to eight weeks and he continues to do it here. But now we're kind of like, Oh, you know, he's not a consistent player. Clearly. Yeah. It's like, it's funny. It's kind of like when you break a serve and mm -hmm. then you have to like hold serve and consolidate it. It's kind of like that. You get your breakout tournament and mm -hmm. then it's like, we wait and see whether you can consolidate it and get decent results to the next few tournaments. Like for example, when Ben Shelton made the quarterfinals of the Australian Open in 2023, he didn't consolidate it at all. <laughs> he then went out and lost in like the first round of the next 30 tournaments. <laughs> but yeah. co co uh, conversely, he did consolidate it kind of after the U.S. Open uh -huh. because he made the semifinal in that. And then he went out and did pretty well in the tournaments at the end of the year, won in Tokyo. And so had good results after that tournament that kind of were like, okay, no, he's at this level. It's not just that one tournament that was a standout. Yeah, well said. And Ben Shelton was the guy who came to mind for me too because he had just such a big breakout and you have to back it up or else you just kind of become one of those like, oh, you know, he had, I think he made a deep run that tournament. But otherwise your name's kind of forgotten. Yeah, like uh, the Korean guy that beat Djokovic <laughs> and the uh, Australian, what was it, 2018? Yeah, see? Yeah, and I don't know his name. I also, I think I know the, I, the I'm the i close to it, but I don't want to take a guess mm -hmm. and be way off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there's also, um, I'm also blanking on the name, but the Swedish guy who beat Nadal in the Roland Garros at Federer won. Robin Soderman. Soderman, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, if he would have won that tournament, 
Or yeah, you know, one of those funny is Soderling actually made the French Open final twice, 2009 and 2010. And oh, shit. Yeah, this, the second one, Nadal beat him in the <laughs> final. So Probably in straight. Yeah, exactly. But it, it was uh, tough for him. It's, I mean, mm-hmm. he was it was a solid player. And then I think in 2011, he lost to Nadal again. And yeah. It wasn't in like the, the final or semis, but it was like the quarters or something mm-hmm. like that. But anyway, speaking of Nadal, uh, he obviously lost in the first round to Zverev. And whoa, whoa, whoa. what do you mean, obviously? Because I'm pretty sure you were saying, yeah, no, I mean, I bet on him, I bet on him to win, but I wasn't that shocked when he lost, to be honest. (laughs) But I was watching this match, I watched this whole match, and it felt bad, kind of, because Nadal had chances. In the second set, he was up a break, and he actually served for the second set, but then he immediately lost that game at love. Mm -hmm. And then he broke early in the third set, but then was unable to consolidate it. So to me, this match just kind of felt like there was a combination of so many things. Like, Nadal was almost there, but it's like, okay, there's still a little bit of rust. And he's feeling feeling a little bit older than he was, obviously, in like 2022 when he last played in Roland Garros. And he's not 100% healthy. And it just felt like all of these things were just holding him back a little bit. And he couldn't perform it at the peak level he needed to to beat a guy like Zverev. But I, it's just tough to watch that because he, he was so close on a couple of occasions there. I mean, yeah, exactly. Like you said, he was so close. And this is against a guy like Zverev. So imagine if they kind of eased him in. He was playing someone, you know, ranked 100 or even a qualifier. I think we we would still see the rust, but the margin of error is a lot greater. You know, like he could, he could not play as well and still win. But if you're playing Zverev first round, you better play your best tennis. And he just couldn't do it that day. 100%. 100%. It was a, definitely a very tough draw. Yeah, that um, the tension also just with the last time they played. Remember on that court, Zverev broke his ankle. So you're kind of thinking maybe Zverev is you know feeling a little on edge, but he came out swinging. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I I always I always think about that. Like, mm-hmm. how do, how do you trust that ankle being out there on the same court? Like every time he slides that way, he's got to be like, Ugh, hold yeah, on, he's ankle. gonna sound fucked. <laughs> But I, I feel like if I was in the doll, I would try to replicate that point every time. Oh we we're just like trying to get oh him God. out there stretched. Yeah, that's uh that, that would be a a bold a bold strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that book playing? Is it playing dirty? No. No idea. What oh. <laughs> uh I don't know what you're referencing, but yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it's Brad, Brad some... Gil Brad Gilbert won- Oh, it's called Winning Ugly. Winning ugly, yeah, yeah, Brad, yeah, yeah. Brad Gilbert, yeah, yeah, okay, but uh, yeah. Anyway, moving on to the round of sixty-four. This was actually a f- kind of funny round because I feel like we kind of had a couple of guys blow two set leads. One of which was Hachinov, who blew a two set lead versus Kovalik, who I've never heard of. Who? He's <laughs> exactly he's a qualifier. <laughs> And it's like, when I mean I've never heard of him, I'm like, I've never seen his name even in a draw. And then all of a sudden, he's through to the third round at French Open. I'm like, that's yeah. pretty crazy. Even if though it's not like that deep of a run, really, it's like mm-hmm. you're still in like the top 32 players in the world, and I've never heard your name. Yeah, and, and I, there are players who go a, their whole career without winning a Grand Slam match, and this guy just kind of comes in there. Exactly, exactly. And he's like 32 or something. Yeah. I'm like, he's not like a super young guy that just like exploded <laughs> onto this the scene. That's... Like uh like uh the guy that won in Lyon, uh in Pesci Pericard, I want to say. Mm-hmm. It's like he's a, a young guy, so it's like when he explodes onto the scene, you're like, Okay, yeah, it makes sense that I've never heard of him because he's pretty young. This guy's like 32 and I've never really seen his name, but yeah, he just made his year's salary. <laughs> exactly, <week. laughs> exactly. Um, and then Baez also blew a two set lead versus Offner. And this one's a little bit more like, yeah, I know Offner. I know the name. I know the guy. I know he's a very solid player, but I'm still kind of shocked that Baez lost this early, given how good of a clay player he is. 
And my thought process is like, was he just exhausted after having a five setter in the first round? And then he comes into this match and just can't finish it out in three sets and slowly just loses energy and then loses it in five. Yeah. I think there are certain guys and I've talked about this before, the like guys who are, you know, they play well during the season, best set of three, but then they can't um, transition that to best of five. And Baez is that guy clearly. I mean, the tough win that he had previously in round one, the five setter, you would like to think that these guys can hand like play a five setter and then play another five setter. So I think not only was it like a physical breakdown, but a mental breakdown too. And I think, you know, we've mentioned momentum a lot. It's just whenever the momentum switches, that's when you start to see players break down. Yeah. hundred percent. And and I just think it's, not a lot of guys can consistently play those five set matches over and over mm-hmm. again. Well, it was pretty cool. So I was I was there and I saw Offner. I didn't watch the match, but I saw him warming up right before. It's like a little side court and he was hitting serves. And it was just cool to be, you know, 15 feet away from him while he's ripping serves. Yeah. Pretty cool. I, I mean, that's the cool experience of being at a, any tennis mm-hmm. tournament, I think. Yeah, 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 definitely. But uh, and then the last thing from this round was uh, both Canadians advancing. I think this is positive for FAA. He's like we talked about. He's con- consolidating his performance that he had at Madrid. He's had a few positive weeks after that, and I think the expe- expectations for him are kind of growing back. And while for some people they might be like, "Oh, that's not that great," it's like added pressure. I think it's a good thing. I think it's good mm-hmm. that we're starting to coming to tournaments now and be like, yeah, I expect FAA to make it through a couple of rounds. Maybe I don't expect him to beat top 10 players, but I do expect him to be able to beat maybe guys outside the top 30. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's good for his confidence too, because the more, you know, stacking up little wins and I think he's gaining respect from the other players as well. Like I feel like the last two years while he was struggling, you know, players because of his past were like, okay, you know, I can't totally disregard FAA, but he's not playing his best tennis. Now I feel like players, when they see him, they're going to be like, okay, you know, this guy's good, but he's been struggling, but now he's kind of trending upwards. So you have to pay a little more attention to that. Yeah, exactly. And then, I mean, speaking of a guy that's trending downwards, (laughs) Shapovalov beat Tiafo, and Tiafo is now the number five American and is the number 28 guy in the world just continues to kind of just slide down on those rankings. I honestly thought he might lose in his first round match that, but he won the match in five and then comes into this match and can't get it done against a guy that like Shapovalov, who isn't necessarily known for being that great of a clay player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's super inconsistent too. You know, I feel like, if you're playing shop evolve, all you need to do is play good tennis. Doesn't need to be great. Just play good tennis and he will make errors. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you ha- your standard for tennis has to be pretty high uh-huh. to be able to be like, yeah, just play good tennis. And <laughs> yeah, all right. Shop evolve, yeah. But I do Tiafo, agree, just play I, your game. Yeah. You, know? you don't have to do any crazy game plan. Usually mm-hmm. unless you have evolve, plays one of those matches where he plays out of his mind, which he yeah, can do. Which he does. He does, definitely. But, yeah, I think generally if you just play your game plan and you're like a top 20, 30 guy, you can probably beat Shapovalov. Yeah. But that sucks about Tiafa, man. 28? Yeah. From being like Jeez. number 10 uh, a little over a year ago. Yeah. So Korda surpassed him. Yeah, exactly. Because they were exactly. like what – I think he might have been one or two spots. I think, than yeah, Korda I think Korda, I, I think it's they kind of almost flip flopped. Uh-huh. I think Tiafa was around maybe 25, 26, mm-hmm. and uh, Korda was maybe like 28. And now I think uh, yeah. Korda is like 25, 26, and Tiafa is down to, yeah, just um, 28. okay, just sticking on Korda for a second. So I watched the Alcaraz Korda match, and despite three sets, like it was still close, and Korda. I was just watching his fluidity of his shots. It kind of kind of reminded me of Roger Federer in a way where he would, you know, get around his backhand and hit that inside out forehand. And just the, his movement, everything looked so elegant and graceful. 
And it was so exciting to watch him. But then the other side was Alcaraz was just too good. Like it's yeah. it's like playing against a wall. Yeah. I mean, Alcaraz is just scary on clay. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. scary overall, but yeah. especially on clay, he's Dude, a- the best. The best is when they show his box and there it's like five dudes up front all wearing the same exact stuff, just locked in, like no smiles, no joking around, no leaning back. They're all locked in and every point fists like not even a pump just fists up like this yeah those dudes freaking get it you know imagine having that team yeah my dad uh <laughs> he was watching one of the matches and he was like i don't know if i would want my box to be like he was looking at mahach his uh-huh. box in the his match with medvedev and the their play their coach was reacting like in really <laughs> wild ways to like every point like Mahach missed a shot and the coach was like oh my god yeah. and then like he would make a shot and the coach would stand up and like yeah. whip his towel around <laughs> and you're like this dude is into it which is good but it's like he has way too big of reactions I think he's supposed to be like the rock that mm. this guy can kind of look to and he's just looking like a regular fan yeah, that's funny. That's funny, like just being in the box and having to kind of differentiate yourself from a regular fan. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, but uh, anyway, so uh, let's hop right into the round of 32. So this is the last round we're going to cover for uh, this update here. Uh, first up, Arnaldi beating Rublev in straight sets. This was like the first really like big upset of the tournament where Rublev was a guy where he's not necessarily considered – a major contender for the title, but he was a guy that we were like, okay, we expect a really deep run from him. He has performed very well on clay this year or has performed really well in some tournaments on clay this year. And Arnaldi just comes out here and kind of crushes him. But additionally, Rublev just has a complete mental breakdown in this match. And I'm just like, what happened to that more stoic Rublev we saw in Madrid that had such success like he just completely abandoned that and loses early here i know i think he's got to got to do something as far as sports psychologists or someone on his team to help him with that because it's clearly his achilles heel yeah Um, exactly yeah did you see the video of him like sleeping before the match i did not i did okay so he's sleeping on the floor he's got like a towel as a blanket and then a towel rolled up behind his head yeah uh, then, yeah, maybe something's just going on out, outside the court. Yeah, and then he just gets in there and he's just like <laughs> slamming his racket yeah. against himself. Yeah, maybe he needed he extra energy to attack himself. <laughs> Yo, maybe he didn't get a good night's sleep and he's like a child where he gets cranky. Yeah, exactly. He's <laughs> like, I didn't get all my 18 hours last yeah. night. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. The, t- some tennis players are so funny. Like, he kind of reminds me of someone who's chill, like, like a Bublik or Medvedev who – have admitted they stay up late like playing video games and just dicking around like wake up at 10 a.m for a 1 p.m match <laughs> yeah exactly like curios yeah oh hitting the pubs yeah exactly hitting the pubs i feel like i've seen videos of like curios being like streaming a video game or something and then being <laughs> like oh i got a match in like six <laughs> hours oh man it's that talent is crazy to be able to yeah. do that 100 percent. but uh then uh, the other big match I kind of wanted to bring up for uh, round of 32 was Greek Spore versus Zverev. Greek Spore completely choked. Match goes to five sets, and Greek Spore has decent momentum going into that fifth set, but he l- ends up breaking twice and led 4 1 in that final set. And then he just kind of fell apart and he was like double faulting and just wasn't playing like he had to get to that point. And for me, I think it's kind of just good fortune for Zverev because he would have been the first, like, real contender out of the tournament where, like, before the tournament, people were like, Zverev has a very good chance of winning the whole thing. And this would have been a pretty big upset here, but was able to kind of weather the storm that Grease Spore kind of put in his path there. Yeah, I mean, I... I think this goes back to exactly what we were talking about in the beginning. Greek sports, just not a five set guy just fell apart. Yeah. I was, I was kind of mixed. I was conflicted because I wanted Greek sport. Um, but I also want to see Zverev do well. Like I'm fully on board the Zverev train right now. Yeah. He's, For- he's my top three favorite. 
Mm. For me, I think I look at a, a match like that and I don't really have a, a dog in the fight. But when Greek sport goes up 4-1 in the final set, I want him to win. Because mm-hmm. one of my least favorite things in any sport is choking. And so unless I have like, unless I was like really rooting for Zverev, I would want Greek sport to at least hold on in that last set. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, um, maybe this has something to do with the case where Zverev just dug deep. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, we, we won't touch on that. I yeah. don't think in this week because it had just started. You know, there's some pretty crazy allegations I just saw, but don't want to stir the stir yeah. the pot. We wanna can see what happens. Don't rock the boat. Yeah, yeah. See what happens after the the case. Uh-huh. But yeah, so overall through the first three rounds, uh, I think the big takeaway is like it's mainly just the top seeds advancing. There haven't been that many crazy shocks, uh, and then my big question after these first few rounds is how is fatigue going to play into it? I talked about the same thing at the Australian open. I'm going to talk about it at every grand slam. (laughs) Fatigue is a big thing because you're playing extra sets. And so you have some guys through these first few rounds that have lost only one set. Seven guys that are still in the tournament have only lost one set. Sinner is actually the only guy so far that hasn't dropped a set. And then you have other guys that are being pushed. Six of the remaining guys have at least played a five-setter. And you look at Hercatch and Fritz, their other two matches went to, to four sets overall too. So you're looking at these guys where every match they're playing, they're getting pushed a little bit, or they've had multiple matches that weren't super easy. And that's how's that going to play into matches like Djokovic versus Serendolo, where Djokovic has three more hours on court than Serendolo, and he's a lot older. I mm-hmm. get that he has the higher like peak of skill, but those three extra hours on court, are they going to play a factor here? I don't know. I think it's less for Djokovic because he has so much experience, Right. but there are going to be matchups that happen like that where a, one guy is a lot more fresh. Another one is Hercatch versus Dimitrov. Hercatch, an extra two and a half hours on court. Like, that just kind of balances out the fact that he is whatever five years younger than Dimitrov. I think just having that extra two and a half hours on court is going to be a big positive for Grigor out there. Yeah, no, I, I know you mentioned um, Djokovic and that's kind of interesting because yeah, it's something you wouldn't normally worry about like oh, extra three hours, but he hasn't really been playing much tennis. So maybe there is a fatigue component. I'm not sure, but something I do want to look out for um you know, Sinner, Alcaraz, and FAA, three guys who are kind of known to cramp. And mm-hmm. this could come into play later on. I don't see it as much of a problem for Alcaraz just because, you know, we haven't seen that the cramping be an issue for at least a year. But Sinner, FAA kind of um, worry me about that. Luckily, it hasn't been too hot in Paris. It's been pretty cool, actually, a lot of rain. So I don't think, and especially the big guys, you know, they're playing primetime matches at night where it's even cooler. So yeah, and they they're, they're guys that haven't really been mm-hmm. pushed as far. So yeah. at least so far in this tournament, right, right. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Exactly, and and we're, speaking of what we're is we're going to see in these next mm-hmm. rounds, uh, let's jump into our our Grand Slam pick'em for this uh, round four here. So ooh, ooh, it's ooh. actually nice because last time we uh, we did this, we were talking about round three and round four so we were getting kind of variance in matchups now we're looking just round four so uh let's just start it off uh arnaldi versus city who'd you go for here oh my god so i want to take city so bad but i think i'm gonna go upset here it's that's, just kind of i feel it i feel that's the what i went i went with arnaldi <laughs> yeah. and you'll you'll see my confidence in this one uh-huh. uh, a little bit later in the pod all right all right uh um, faa alcaraz yeah, I am going with Alcaraz here. I think that Alcaraz is just a favorite to win the whole tournament. Yeah, same. Can't can't go against them this early. Yeah, and then uh, her catch versus Dimitrov. I went with uh, Dimitrov because of that time on court aspect. So I went with Dimitrov as well because he has a 5-0 and record against her catch. So I think this is some kind of matchup that favors Dimitrov. Mm. Um, you know, it and, could be different on clay, but he's just got his, his name. Yeah, his number. Um, and then uh, Sinner versus Mutet. I feel like this is a, a 
kind of obvious one. I, I wasn't going to pick that crazy upset of the best guy in the world right now. So <laughs> I'm going with center here. Yeah, I'm going center too. But I think Motet is going to give him issues. He's a little pass, especially with the French crowd too. He's going to totally buy into that. 100%. But 100%. Center, he's, center's got to lock in. He's the type of player that's going to be like completely playing into that. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, Fritz Rude. I, I went with Rude here. I mean, I picked Rude for my winner of the whole thing a couple weeks ago. I was like, I don't want to go against yeah. him at this point now. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm going Rude too. I think my thought process is here that Rude's just going to grind down Taylor. I think they're going to get into long points and he's just going to sustain him. Mm. And then uh, Gaminar versus Medvedev. Oh, I know who you're taking. <laughs> of course, I got to go with the demon. I and I also think Medvedev just... Like, it's funny because I was watching Medvedev's matches, like I I talked about, versus Mahach, and it's like Medvedev just has to be so patient on clay, and I think he doesn't like that, and I think Deminar is going to force him to have to be patient. Mm -hmm. So I was so conflicted on this one, but because I knew you are going to take Deminar, I'm going to take Medvedev, make Mm -hmm. it interesting. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting, the fact that, like, we made these lists completely separately, and yeah. we were just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of on the same page, even with the upsets here. I know, I know. Uh, uh, and then uh, Djokovic versus Serendolo. I don't know if we're on the same page with this one. I'm actually going with Serendolo in this match. I think this is the match that Djokovic loses. Everyone's going to be like, "What happened here?" And uh, Serendolo is going to be like, "Yeah, I, I'm a, I'm that guy." And I think it's just the big factor is going to be the the time on court and the fact that Djokovic hasn't necessarily played that well so far this tournament. Yeah, we are not on the same page here. I'm I'm going with Djokovic. I'm ready for him to avenge Tommy Paul. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I can understand the Djokovic. <laughs> the guy is like the the one of the best guys in the world. Obviously, he's ranked number one right now. I just think that he he's been upsettable i'll say mm-hmm. this yeah, year he definitely is and cerno is probably a good chance to do it i just feel yeah. like with djokovic and center there was really no explanation just pick them <laughs> yeah um and then finally zvera versus runa who'd you go for in this one dude this is so tough so tough especially because i said i was on the zvera train but i am going with runa just i, I feel like a gut instinct that rune is going to jump on him early and zverev he gets pretty rattled and when he does he does not play great tennis and i think runa is that guy that'll just kind of knock him off just a bit you know he won't be able to hold serve as well so runa can't yeah. believe i'm saying I mean, this is funny because yeah. we had like first five matchups we were all in sync and now <laughs> yeah. last three i'm going with zverev here because yeah. i just think he's going to be able to sort of out consistency Runa, even though he did get pushed, it kind of goes against my arguments for some of the other matches mm-hmm. about uh, guys being fresher and that playing into it. But I do think that for Zverev, he's going to be a little bit more comfortable. And I think Runa's inconsistencies are going to show. Yeah. I mean, we this this will be interesting how it plays out. I'm pretty pumped here. Yeah, 100%. And I, I'm glad we have a, a couple of... Uh, <laughs> controversial ones there so we can uh, at least see who uh who is able to get the the better guesses here yeah 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 we'll put out i'll put out a, a tweet or something and we can kind of track this sounds good sounds good but already you ready to uh, hop into segments yeah let's do it what is new in tennis so uh i'll go first this week i think <laughs> but mm-hmm. uh my what's new was uh the french open banning alcohol so uh, David Whoa. Goffin, uh, Belgian player, obviously uh, legend, played has played in like the ATP finals. Uh, said a fan spit gum at him in his match, and overall the crowds were being a little bit raucous. And just these actions led to the tournament director deciding to ban alcohol, and he was like, "This behavior is unacceptable." And I I did see some funny articles or memes talking about the U.S. Open just being happy to to see <laughs> the other tournaments doing this because obviously at the U.S. Open I feel like alcohol sales are a pretty big thing. They have like all those specialized drinks, and oh, I think yeah. just for the French Open this is probably a massive profit loss that they didn't want to have to do. But I completely understand why they did. 
Oh, massive profit and loss. Wow. Um, that's that's crazy. I, I did see he was pretty pissed about it, but I didn't see that they actually banned the alcohol, which is unprecedented, I feel like, for tennis, especially at a Grand Slam, because it's such a big part of it. Like when I was there, um, you know, obviously a ton of alcohol sales. I was kind of partaking. It was yeah. just a ton of fun. Like the energy is there. But you didn't see hard liquor. It was either beer or wine. Like champagne or wine. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas at the U.S. Open, they serve vodka drinks. Yeah, they're like, they don't have Le Honeydew or whatever it <laughs> yeah. is in French. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. But, oh, man, I mean, what do you think? I, I mean, I think that's kind of... It's, it's understandable, the decision. It's one they didn't want to make. Mm -hmm. And I think when you see a, a tournament director, director make a decision like that, it's like, I always am going to respect it because I think that he doesn't want to have to make that decision. And mm -hmm. he's doing it for the good of the players. Mm -hmm. So I guess this kind of feeds right into the stereotype, huh? What which stereotype is that? That the French are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, jokes, no comments. Jokes. No comments. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, um, what did you see this week? What's new for you? Oh, I saw something pretty neat. So Roland Garros introduces head cams for the chair umpires. Mm. Um, so their reasoning brings viewers even closer to the action and their interactions with players. I think this is super cool. This kind of reminds me of a body cam for a police officer. Yeah. Because my first, my initial reaction was, you know, I've, I noticed it before I actually saw the article. So I'm watching mm. tennis and I see like the cam view on TV. I'm like, whoa, this is pretty cool. You know, you can see the mark, you can see him point to the mark. And then they show the umpire with this like freaking sci-fi Tron like head <laughs> camera thing. And yeah. I'm like, whoa, that that's pretty interesting. So I yeah. looked it up, looked into it, and so they they announced it. Um, I think it's awesome. I think it's really cool, and especially for the entertainment part too, where you yeah. can like see their interaction with the players. You could see them calling line calls, and it's just like I said, we need to hold these refs accountable because they've been messing up a lot. Yeah. I can't wait for the blooper reel of that where it's like <laughs> some guy with a head cam like falling off the chair yeah. or something. And he's like, ooh, boom, right into the oh, ground. Yeah. He like pulls out his phone, starts scrolling Instagram. Yeah, exactly. You're like, what is or this? Or texting dude doing? even. Yeah, dude. exactly. Oh my God. Exactly. This match sucks. So boring, dude. <laughs> yeah. But uh anyway, let's uh, let's hop into bed of the week. Who'd you go for this week? So <laughs> this is actually funny. Um, I'm going with Deminar plus 160 over Medvedev as, a, as a, a pure hedge to my pick them, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I can't be wrong, right? Yeah, um, I guess. I mean, I think that I I try to go in the in the same realm, but I understand yeah. the, the hedge here. <laughs> and I also think it, it, to an extent you could be like, well, even if you think Medvedev is going to win, mm -hmm. like Deminar plus 160, maybe it's just like good enough odds where it's like, Dang. like, I don't know whether Deminar is that much of an underdog. That's exactly what I was thinking. It's, you know, to me, this match could go either way. And I thought the other matchups were pretty lopsided as far as odds goes. But, you know, I like the 160. So Medvedev does have the 6-2 to two advantage. But but they've never played on clay. So this okay. will be the first time. Yeah, that's definitely a big factor, too. Like we talked about last week, yeah, clay exactly. uh, plays a big role. Exactly. Uh, I'm going with, uh, like you said, a lot of the other odds were pretty lopsided. I'm going with Arnaldi plus 380 over oh Sitsi Pass. I'm going for this this uh, matchup. I'm, I'm excited for it. And, I mean, I just think Arnaldi's been playing so well through the first few rounds. He, he clobbered Rublev. And I get that he's a significant underdog. But we've seen Sitsi Pass have that inconsistency. And I think Arnaldi is just going to have his moment right now. Yeah, I'm with you. I think this is exactly why I picked Arnaldi in the in the pick'em. He's just he looks good and since it's a little bit of both, right? It's like Arnaldi looks better than he normally does, and Sitsipas looks a little worse than he normally does. And I think when when that happens, or this is a big chance for Arnaldi to kind of take a big step and play aggressive, play free. Like he's playing against, you know, top ten guy in the world. Who cares? You know, he's expected to lose, but he can come out swinging. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, how about match of the week? What'd you go for this week? 
All right. Well, match of the week. I went with Zverev crushing all of our dreams of Rafa winning another Roland Garros title. I beat him 6-3, 7-6, 6-3. I picked this match because I was there. This was my first time ever seeing Rafa play in person and probably, you know, one of the last times he will be playing. So I thought this was Especially super cool. At Roland Especially Garros. At Roland Garros, exactly. Very cool. So like everything about this match was just fantastic from the walkout, you know, like five minutes standing ovation for Rafa. Um the energy of the crowd. This was pre alcohol band. So yeah. everyone was going nuts. Everyone in that stadium was rooting for Rafa. Uh, the points were amazing. They were nice and long. It was cool to see Rafa's top spin up in person because, you know, I've really only seen it on TV. Uh, and then the last part, the speeches. So, like I said, everyone was pulling for Rafa, but it was still respectful because Zverev played a lot of great points and, you know, obviously won a lot of great points. And the crowd would still give him the respect. They would clap. They wouldn't. There was a couple times they would kind of, you know, say something between serves or like cheer on double double faults. But it was manageable. And I thought, um, I thought it was a class act by Zverev because at the end, you know how they normally, the loser just kind of rushes off and then they do a like a victory speech mm. or interview. So they gave Zverev the first interview and he kept it short and sweet. He was like, Hey, you know, play a great opponent. Um, but this isn't about me. This is about Rafa right now. So thank you guys. Literally mm. that's it. And then they interviewed Rafa second, like with everyone there and the crowd. And it was just sad, man. Super sad to see. And I don't need to touch on the, like the specifics, but like you said, it was really tight and Rafa did have chances. So just couldn't capitalize on him. Um, I yeah, getting chills talking about this match. So great, great one of the week. Yeah, I I, I agree. I think the build up to this match was big, mm -hmm. and I think even though it wasn't more than three sets, I think it did kind of deliver on Rafa playing decently, and mm -hmm. like, like he didn't get clobbered by Zverev, which would have been kind of uh, depressing to see. Yeah, I mean, he came out with dignity. You know, he could hold his head high, and it, it helps that Zverev was playing, like, some of the best tennis of his career right now. Yeah, 100%. All right, what about you? What was my, your match uh, of the week? My match of the week was Runa holding on to beat Kowali in five. And oh. this match was interesting because, honestly, through the first, few, first two sets, it kind of just looked like Runa was going to just cruise, was going to be – just an average second round match for him. But then in the third set, he just, he, he got broken and just could not break back. He had six break points and could not convert them. And then in the fourth set, he actually broke first, but then cons couldn't consolidate it and then was broken again. And it really showed to me that t tennis is like, we've talked about many times in the past. It's a game of a few key points in the third and fourth set, Kaboli was four or five on break points. So when he got his chances, he broke. And mm -hmm. those ended up being critical because that's how he won the, the two sets. Even though he got broken in the fourth set, he got two breaks back. And then the fifth set was super tight. Both guys had a ton of chances to break. It's actually funny because neither guy was actually able to convert. So nobody got any breaks in that set but when you're watching it it's still super tense because it feels like it could any game could go either way yeah that is and then uh at the end of the match they go to this match tie break and runa goes down 5-0 in the match tie break and luckily he has the the space for it to get to 10 and ends up coming back in that and winning it 10 to 7 so Super tense, and like I said, especially in that last set and tie break. Wow, big big creds to Runa for digging deep there on that last tie break, coming down from 05. But still, this makes you think, you know, should he have even been that close with someone like Kaboli? I know Kaboli's good, but I feel like for Runa to establish himself as a top player, he should win in four pretty comfortably. Yeah, I mean... It's one of those situations where you're like, okay, he got the win. Like, but a win's a win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It wins a win, but it's like Zverev and Greek sport. Should 
should Zverev have been down two breaks in the fifth <laughs> against Greeksport? Probably not based on <laughs> what we know of the level he can produce, yeah, but yeah. It, it's just how it goes sometimes. Good point. And I guess to counter my argument, you know, he maybe proved himself as a top player by being able to come back by being able to. Yeah. Having the, the mental strength this. to uh-huh. not just yeah. give up in that, in that moment. Yeah, exactly. All right. And that's the show. If you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You can find us on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube at Painting Lines Podcast. Feel free to shoot us a DM or email us any questions or thoughts at paintinglinespodcast at gmail.com.